Hello and welcome. Um, today I have two very interesting philosophers, very interesting YouTube creators here to talk to. Uh, on the one hand, we've got Hans Georg Meller, professor for philosophy in Macau. Uh, he has two YouTube channels himself. Uh, one's called Carefree Wandering, and the other one is Philosophy in Motion. And interestingly, he combines philosophies of the East and the West, uh, there's an interesting synthesis going on uh, between Taoist philosophy, between thinkers of China with a, with a firm grasp of the Chinese language, uh, as well as German philosophers, systems theory, uh, etc. And on the other hand, we've got Dr. Johannes Niederhauser, who has his own YouTube channel. And uh, Johannes has uh, talks about predominantly German philosophy. He's spoken a lot about Heidegger, uh, but also Nietzsche and Hegel. And this is especially an interesting crossover point where I've uh, seen Georg also reference the three of them, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Hegel as well. And both of them I met at a conference I organized in Cambridge. And the reason I had invited them was because they have a let's see, differing, more German-inspired view as well of AI and whether AI can be conscious um, on the question of artificial intelligence in general. And so I would like to discuss some of the points where they seem to overlap, they seem to talk about similar things. And I'd like to begin with the topic of identity. So especially Georg focuses a lot on identities, written the book, uh, You and Your Profile where he focuses on different technologies of identity. And without getting too deep into the different technologies of identities you introduce, you talk about something that you refer to as genuine pretending, uh, a mode of uh, identity, almost not to be seen separate from the other technologies of identity, something where you are at ease, something where you um, where you are in the world in a more dissociated way from any rigid framework of identity. And I would like to explore today how this ties into the Heideggerian um, way, the Heideggerian mode of Gelassenheit, of being in the world, or as Johannes translates it to, in the world being. And I'd like to start first with Georg and ask you, what do you mean when you say genuine pretending? What does that uh, signify? Uh, well, generally, first of all, this notion um, is actually uh, coined by Paul D'Ambrosio, uh, with I, with co-author of this book, You and Your Profile, but also co-author of a previous book on Taoist philosophy on the Taoist text, the Chuanzi. So um, basically, we use this notion of Taoist, uh, of genuine pretending to um, describe or yeah, to describe what the basically the Taoist existential position is. So uh, most simply put, genuine pretending is, let's say, the existential condition that everyone shares. Uh, so um, we are all genuine pretending all the time. Uh, the problem is that uh, we don't, we are not aware of it, and we develop other. Uh, notions uh, and um, so um, of how what who we are and and how we exist. So genuine pretending uh, to say a little bit more is of course a paradoxical uh, paradoxical term, right? Um, and um, the idea is basically that we that we shape an identity through, uh, we shape and then genuinely become who we are through uh, pretending. Now, what is pretending? Uh, pretending has uh, two meanings. Uh, of course, it means uh, um, uh, basically somehow, well, yeah, simply to pretend uh, something um, um, that you may not, not necessarily essentially be. But then there's also um, uh, this, tied to this, this uh, usage of the word specifically in English, well, it's an English word, uh, uh, re related to child play, right? So uh, that's a very kind of common form of child play that you 
uh, whatever you play uh, uh, king and queen or whatsoever, right? And then you pretend you're a king or queen, and and um, so in this way, basically, the identities that we assume are an effect of pretending. And again, the idea is that this is not just the case in child play, but that basically this is the case uh, throughout society. All social identities are socially constructed, as we could say nowadays. Uh, and the point is that this is not, um, uh, let's say, um, again, paradoxically, that this is not a violation of genuineness, but uh, to the contrary, that through this kind of pretending, through this kind of social construction, reality, social reality, genuineness, and what we perceive as being genuine is thereby constructed, right? Simply put, you know, we are born, Heidegger, Geworfenheit, we're thrown into something, but we're basically uh, empty. We don't really have an identity. And through um, playing, for instance, roles or other form of shaping an identity, uh, we eventually um, develop the capacity to uh, somehow be genuine. And again, um, to see this, um, to, to, to see, to understand that genuineness is a result, let's say, of, of pretense or is a result of a social construction, um, uh, th that is, um, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's again, that's what, what, what I think that, that this insight can lead to some form of existential ease. It can somehow lead to some form, then use the Heideggerian term, Gelassenheit. Uh, and uh, that this is somehow the um, a main kind of theme in Taoism, or kind of a, a purpose of, let's say, practical Taoist philosophy, would be through a recognition and an affirmation of genuine pretending, achieve a form of uh, existential ease. So this is uh, basically the point. Okay. And uh, so Johannes, in, in what way would you say, does that tie into your understanding of the word Gelassenheit? So uh, one, one other notion I saw in your book is also the notion of drafting with ease. Right, it was taken from some uh, Taoist story, if I remember correctly, uh, Georg. So yes. drafting with ease, the the word draft, arguably maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but uh, is also entailed uh, with in in Heidegger with the word entwurf, uh, and and how would you understand it, Johannes, if someone would be drafting with ease, someone have Gelassenheit in their entwurf, let's say. I think we want to be strict with Heidegger. Uh, Gelassenheit specifically only comes into play, let's say, in the 1950s, and it has to do specifically with uh, technology. Um, I think it's always a bit dangerous to move too quickly from being in time to the later text. We can get into that maybe a bit later. The way in which I understand Gewolfenheit or thrownness is that we're not thrown as an empty vessel, as a tabula rasa into, a, into a nothing at all, but we, it's actually we're thrown into, let's say, a language, uh, a family, um, a, to speak in, the, in common vernacular terms, a culture, a country, a region, uh, and that the, oh, none of this is chosen. And it's it's exactly the misunderstanding of Sartre uh, to think that there's some sort of noumenal realm in which the human being self posits completely freely. That's the mis the Sartrean misunderstanding of Heidegger. But that give off and hide thrownness to be thrown means and precisely that there is nothing is chosen about who we are. And it is only from that thrownness, from that accepting of that thrownness, that Entwurf can, uh, you know, so it's Gewolf and there's a notion of, of being collected into that original throw. Uh, and Dasein remains thrown, as Heidegger says, throughout its existence. It's being stretched out between birth and death. And only through accepting one's 
death and finitude uh, can one in an authentic way and that's something we can also discuss what that's supposed to mean um entwerfen so i actually more like throw oneself out of that original throw which sounds pretty weird in english probably also in german and however i would say that it one can never fully overcome that original uh uh, uh thrownness that one uh, comes with uh it's it's in a way um only through a, a an acceptance of it an affirmation of it that one becomes free that dasein generates uh, for itself its own most possibilities those possibilities that are own most to it um and maybe so briefly to gelassenheit what so i think the english term is releasement which is also an invention the um being released perhaps is better so being being released into the world or so um gelassenheit zu den dingen und offenheit für das geheimnis is actually the complete uh, formula here so it's releasement towards things and openness towards the secret or the mystery and it's mentioned in the countryside um countryside conversations or you no know, so countryside path conversations and which are dialogues that heidegger has with himself basically uh, <laughs> as far as i can tell and in the other text is is the uh, memorial address to konradin kreuzer who was a composer also from Meskirk, the same hometown as Heidegger, where Heidegger mentions this, the Gelassenheit zu den Dingen, and that is specifically uh, with regards to technological tools, which he says we must let into our homes, but also not take over our world at the same time, to say yes and no at the same time uh, to them. So that's how, we, yeah, I think with, with so Gewolfenheit, I would say um, there, there, there is a certain uh, playfulness in play, but uh, I, it, I don't think that with, uh, so we come with a, with a certain um, uh, unchosen and un, unmitigatable, unchangeable sort of, I don't know if unchangeable is the right word, but a completely just, you cannot deny your mother tongue uh, and that will forever structure your being in the world and the way in which the world discloses itself to you, For just as one example. Interesting. So um, one one thing I kind of understood in the, in the notion of Gelassenheit as well is a, a sense of letting things be themselves in a sense or like letting things um uh, uh, you know leaving things in a sense to their own devices in a way uh, now this understanding of uh, identity that something some essence uh, is identical with itself uh, it can be itself uh, georg would you see that as a as a form of like a, a, a paradigm, a cultural paradigm of authenticity, or would you say that's older in a sense and um, more fundamental? And what you mean by authenticity, for example, is something more limited and contingent to like a cultural practice of uh, socialization, etc. cetera. Uh, first of all, I like to kind of, um... I don't know, apologize for you having used these Heideggerian terms, uh, Gewaffenheit and Gelassenheit. Um, uh, sorry for not directly, immediately at least, uh, addressing your point, uh, but I wanted to respond to what Johannes said. Um, because, um, I mean, there's been a lot of like in scholarship about Heidegger and Asian thought, right? Uh, because Heidegger was actually a little bit, at least, uh, the, the, the extent to which this is uh, the case has been a, is a matter of debate, but uh, he was, let's say, at least actively uh, uh, reading and, and thinking about uh, Taoist philosophy, even translating parts of the Lao Tzu. 
And so, um, but my point is not that, uh, is neither that uh, Taoism and Heidegger are the same, uh, nor that they are incompatibly different. Uh, my point was not really to make a comparative point, comparison between uh, Taoism and uh, Heidegger in any specific form. I was not trying to imply anything for how to read or how understand Heidegger. Uh, going back to what I said about genuine pretending, I just wanted to point out um, that um, I use this term uh, geworfenheit in the sense that, so to speak, um, uh, identity is not something, a human identity is not something, it's something contingent, right? And I, 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 uh, re I regard identity as contingent, and I, I think um, the notion of geworfenheit is also a notion of contingency, right? Uh, I think, but it can be a very, and probably is in Heidegger, very different uh, from what it is exactly in Taoism. So again, um, the point is, and this now addresses your, 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 your question of identity in the sense that humans just do not simply have an identity, right? We're not born with like say like this is a traditional whatever uh notion whatever of the soul right and that that there is this kind of soul that constitutes an individual indivisible right that's a, the this notion of the soul some sort of identity um and and then and, and um that is somehow non-contingent and um simply uh the uh, the idea is that identity is something that needs that you need to construct that you need to build and you need to build it by means of the social and the the, the consciousness and also the the physical um properties that you have or the situation that you find yourself in uh, but it's absolutely necessary to build a sense of identity, both as an individual, as well as for society, to for it to function. And again, the, the idea is that this sense of identity can be built on, on the basis of various means, or let's say, in a to use this kind of metaphorically, you can play different games, and they all uh, uh, they all can do the job of. Uh, eventually building something that is kind of a credible identity, credible both to the individual that has the identity or the collective that has this identity and then genuinely feels uh, and and operates uh, with this identity and uh, um uh, yeah and uh, so that that is the that that identity is a is a complex but necessary construct which nevertheless is, uh, contingent construct. I don't know. Does that address what the, the point you were making? Identity as a contingent construct that uh, that um, that is necessary both for individuals and for society to function the way uh, individuals and society function. Yeah. Well, in in a way, you bring contingency and necessity together in there, right? Like that is a um, uh, a, a common theme with Heidegger as well that there's this this uh, attempt to not uh, think within these dichotomies and polarities, especially like the Cartesian subject object. Uh, and the same I mean, it's way. just like Johannes said, right? I mean, uh, whatever. The, we are born with what language, what culture, what, what gender, what kind of history. That's entirely contingent, right? It's completely mm. contingent, and. On, yet on the basis of these contingencies, in order for you to develop a sense of who you are, uh, for me to be develop a sense of who I am, and for us to be able to have this conversation, uh, we need, in this sense, necessary, but necessary in the sense that we, in order for this to happen, uh, we need to develop a sense of identity. That's all I wanted to say. And yes, so then eventually, that through whatever these these routines that we develop, um, um, even though it's clearly a constructed identity, nevertheless, this identity is genuine. Uh, okay, interesting. the The question would be then the thrownness or the the kind of sit situation you find yourself in is contingent to an extent. However, once, as as uh, Johannes pointed out, once 
you are in this thrownness, um, you know, it's not possible to get behind it. It's not possible to uh, escape it to an extent. So would you say that the development of identity within that mode of thrownness particular uh, exhibits uh, some sort of sense of necessity as it is still bound to a certain ground? What is that how I understand you correctly, Johannes? Yeah, thank you. And uh, one brief point, the German word, as everyone here knows, but maybe not the people who listen for contingency is Zufall, um, which Heidegger speaks of Zufall in the contributions, for example, uh, to philosophy. Uh, this, the, but the way in which Zufall can also be understood is so, something falling upon you or falling to you to fall to someone, to fall upon someone uh, and taking on um, sort of, uh, well, taking on the charge of accepting, speak with Nietzsche, one's, one's fatal, what's, what was dealt, not necessarily as fate in this vernacular meaning that it has, but as, again, as what is necessary and which must be affirmed uh, before uh, before we can uh, ex let's say explore ourselves at all, uh, or also to to quote Nietzsche, uh, what one uh, what does he say? One needs to have absolutely no idea or not know any at all who one is in order to become who one are. That was a bit of a bad paraphrase. So, yeah, I would I would just to say what you just said. Yes, I would agree. I just um, I think um, that when we, well, if we uh, move to, mm, to towards authenticity, I mean, that, that's another word that, that, that means so many things to, to so many uh, people, especially because it's, you know, we live in a time where we, we can eat authentic Italian food uh, anywhere or authentic Chinese food, of course, also. Um, I think that with, with just to stay on Heidegger, um, there there is a sense of of coming into one's own, but that doesn't mean that in authenticity just disappears. So, in in fact, I would say that, that it's not even the shadow of the authentic, or so. It's um, once a certain let's put it in this a bit too simplistic, but once some side of ourselves is revealed. Another side is all is is at the same time closed off, so that maybe brings it back also to this notion of I didn't I don't fully remember the draft. You said the so the Entzug, is that what you intended? Entwurf. No, what did you Entwurf with draft? Well, yeah. the draft can also mean, but it, but at the same time, maybe even the Entwurf is it is only a throw, uh, throwing it towards something, not really know where it's going to land. And at the same time, if as it is being th thrown into the air, um, it, you have to leave something behind, um, which, however, you don't ever fully leave behind in order to get to where you're throwing or drafting yourself towards. Um, so the, the the notion of in draft, at least I heard, uh, because Heidegger says somewhere on on Socrates, Socrates was the purest of all thinkers because he didn't write anything. And he was always standing in the in the draft, in the in zug, or in the withdrawal of uh, being. And I think this is where to bring this back to not taking particularly Taoism, but Far Eastern thought. This is where the I think his Japanese students saw uh, a, a connection that they didn't see with anyone else in the Western tradition. Right. Uh, I mean, especially when it comes but you to you don't era. actually possess, you don't possess your, it's not something you possess or own, or, you know, even, even when you've come into your own, you don't, it's not an object or a thing that you own or possess or that you operate with in the world. It is it, it any interaction to bring this to what, what um, Professor Muller said, brings you, you are playful in your being with others and it, it mirrors how, you, you, if you hold on too tightly, you, you you come across as being, you know, a bit stiff. But if <laughs> you actually have to lose what you think you are in a, in a situation with someone else, in order to be open at all to encounter someone else. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it is also this um, impossibility of going back to the to the Entwurf, to the kind of thrownness uh, is also the existential ground for Heidegger's notion of guilt, right? There's a cer certain um, sense of it, it, it was difficult to understand that passage. It was a certain sense of uh, difficulty, uh, the, the impossibility of kind of taking hold of one's own Entwurf uh, is entailed in this. Do you, can you say something on that, perhaps? Okay, very briefly. Um, schuld, of course, in German is a very peculiar word because uh, as Nietzsche also notes, it can also mean debt. So, uh, and as I always tell my English friends, when, when you say sorry in German, you actually ask for, you know, Entschuldigung, so to be released of your guilt, which is quite different from the English sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even the uh, uh, apology is something else. Um, but I think the, the way in which Heidegger understands guilt is, is non-moral, is ontological in the sense that... Uh, we are indebted, again, not in a monetary sense, but um, we are indebted to, well, to to other Dasein um, for our own being to a certain extent. And we are never free also, we're never free from the they self. There is no purely authentic Dasein. Uh, and and I'm completely outside of everything, and and I've overcome das man or the they self. No, mm -hmm. that's impossible. And when it comes to this um, sense of contingency, when you say when when Georg says, for example, that the uh, the throneness in itself is essentially um, well, initially something contingent, and then identity forms itself based on that. Uh, Georg, would you say that like? A sort of affirmation uh, in the other direction saying that like the throneness is necessary in a sense that this throneness is in its own in its own being meaningful uh, it is not contingent that that is a, an elemental kind of constituent part of an authentic mode of being an authenticity based mode of being where maybe in a Nietzschean way, this Amor Fati sense where you say that this thrownness is affirmed as being necessary rather than seeing as con contingent now without any judgment on this. Um, the, the, the notion of contingency, even though, of course, um, Johannes is right, like it's in the German translation is super, um, but um, for me, it basically means two things, uh, especially then in, in English, um, contingent upon. So it depends on something else, right? So again, like circumstantial, right? So whatever, you're born into a certain time, into a certain gender, into a certain whatever class position. So uh, who you are is contingent upon the circumstances you are born into. So that's one meaning of contingent. See, but then there's a second meaning to it. It means that there are different options still, right? So it's not predetermined, right? So existence is of course also contingent that we don't really, it's not predetermined, right? Things happen and there are always different options, right? Um, not always options you can choose, but always, options how things can go right uh can go this way or that way so these these are these are the two um these are so this is the kind of the condition of contingency we are we find ourselves in right and uh out of this the necessity when i speak of necessity i only mean in the sense that um in uh again um in order to, to, to be the way we are, the way we exist, right? We couldn't imagine, no, no human being couldn't imagine um, really um, themselves without a sense of identity. Right uh, then, uh, right that then we would uh, well, we, there would be like a whatever complete schizophrenic or whatever would have no sense of identity would be unable 
to uh, function normally in society or couldn't have a conversation like with them and so forth. So again, of course, that doesn't mean that, I mean, uh, um, you know, life can also develop differently. There is no necessity for human beings to exist. Like look at Darwin, look at theory of evolution, you know, uh, you can also have life uh, necessary, not necessary, uh, potentially without human beings and therefore also without human society and also without a human sense of identity but the way uh, you know we evolved um uh, in in order to function uh, in the way we do uh, um, I, to, to develop identity is a very kind of um uh, central uh, element of who, of who we are and again but nevertheless uh uh, it is contingent. It's not something that is, um, uh, and it's neither. It's 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 uh, it's it's not predetermined, uh, nor is it in a whatever in a. It's not. It's neither transcendent nor transcendent. And to use philo philosophical um, uh, fach terminology, specific philosophical terminology, it's not in any way. Um, either uh, predetermined, nor is it kind of um, um, essential, substantial. Well, uh, and you would say as well that it's kind of contingent upon technology as well, because I feel like, especially your well, notion no, of... I mean, now it's contingent upon technology, it's because now we live in a technological world. Right. Um, uh, in, in a pre-technological world, it was contingent upon other things. And that's right. the whole point that you kind of, uh, at least that's what I'm interested in, in understanding the contingencies of identity building. I, I and feel, then um, to recognize that these contingencies shift and uh, they shift significantly. And then we can, so, um, yeah. So the that's why I'm speaking of different technologies, just as over time, uh, technologies by which we whatever build our houses or build our tools, uh, uh changed uh also uh the technologies by which we build our sense of selfhood uh, change significantly right i i feel like there's an interesting dialectic going on here where um i feel like you have a focus i don't want to oversimplify but you have a focus on the kind of flux the um the, the contingent flows to which identity changes and um i feel like uh, uh, johannes is very connected with people like Verveki, who focus uh, more on this uh, loss of meaning on the question of how do we reconnect to a sense of being to this, you know, where we have this famous uh, dialectic between Parmenides and Heraclitus, the being becoming kind of uh, 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 distinction in a way. And I would ask here, like, uh, especially see an, uh, an interesting point in the uh, regarding technology, where both of you address it in, in your own ways. So Georg, you, you focus on this technology of identity being profilicity, which is the, let's say, dawning uh, mode of identity in the technological age, one could say. And uh, Johannes, you focus on this kind of end of metaphysics, the kind of cybernetic uh, uh, disintegration in a way, in a way um, that is happening. So the question is, um, to you, Johannes, maybe, would you say that in the technological age, we've gone, we're going into like a merely transformed like mode of identity, or would you say it is actually in a way leading towards, uh, let's say, quote unquote, schizophrenia or, or some sort of uh, uh, destruction? Is, is there a qualitative kind of uh, difference to, uh, to like past modes of identity that you'd see here? Uh, I have to be. Uh, I have to make a confession. I don't necessarily ever think about identity. Um, I would think about, you know, perhaps notions of the self or so, and the notion of the self with which modernity begins, and that's an oversimplification. Obviously, is uh, is the ego cognitive of René Descartes, um, which is strikingly different from the. I mean, first of all, what's what's striking about Neuzeit, about modernity, is that it calls itself Neuzeit and that it begins to 
categorize historical epochs in the way that it does and also to categorize itself you know is this post-modernity or is this already hyper-modernity or is it i've recently heard hypo uh, modernity so even even uh, below modernity but that that to me it is, is itself very uh quite weird um and it, it the 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 way in which again this is uh simplifying it but the way in which modernity understands itself is by a, is by a negation of the of the previous in some sense at least and in descartes what's striking is that the, there is mention of a genius in the latin of a in the greek we one would say daimon of a demon is usually translated but that demon is a malevolent demon a malevolent spirit that may or may not as he says at the end of the first meditation want to uh well lead him astray and uh maybe the demon uh, only makes it seem as though there is an external world and other human beings for the greeks as far as we can uh, still tell one is born twice you're born just as a child as a baby but you're also born spiritually and you are born then to your daimon you are born to the task which you have and which you don't know that you have it in life so in christianity we ask for forgiveness uh we are we hope for salvation i see that by the way i see sort of uh, transhumanism is to me a neo-christianity it promises salvation in the google cloud um if you're uploaded, uh, even, even if you're not uploaded, it promises salvation to some degree from disease, from 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 death, even at some sometimes. And but in the Greeks, that there is no salvation. Everyone goes to Hades. Even if you go to Elysium, you will still be in the underworld, and you will forever long for or miss the light of the sun. Even if you were good, let's say during your life. Um, but even but good doesn't mean good to others so there's no sense of this guilt but it's have you done what you were there to do have you lived up to the demands of your demon so um and now here's a bit of a, a, a now a weird move um that i hope is not too uh, uh, wild uh, but i see in technology so a certain uh, return of our of the archaic um so the the, uh, and in some sense, perhaps uh, precisely because there's something also um, confronting us that has at least potentially some sort of derivative of logos uh, or even just rationality um, in that uh, perhaps we... Um, so what I would think about, let's say this, is uh, even even if there is so even in our technological time, uh, and which perhaps is also only just really a beginning. Who knows? <clears throat> you you could still have completely regard re 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 you know without regarding questions of identity, etc. You you might still have a certain task that you don't know yet that you find and um find through or for example affirming your basic contingency being de dependent upon uh and then drawing something for yourself or drafting or projecting uh to speak in heideggerian uh, language um and once you try to fulfill that task then you're on the path to come back to just heideggerian language uh, on the path to let's say a eigentlichkeit authenticity that's a bit of a long-winded response but so like um with that authenticity georg would you say that authenticity is uh aligns with your notion your understanding of authenticity uh probably not i mean uh johannes um right said earlier that the word of course is used in different ways and um, now it can be used to translate Heidegger's notion of Eigentlichkeit and um, 
that's a very specific philosophical meaning of the term. Now, uh, we, Paul and I, in our book, use the term very differently, right? For us, it's an identity technology, uh, and we don't necessarily think of Englishkeit. Uh, that, um, uh, yeah, that uh, arose in modernity. And so that's, nevertheless, of course, Heidegger's, Heidegger, I would say, and Johannes knows him much better than I, is still a kind of part of this uh, semantics of authenticity, of the age of authenticity, right? And he uses a vocabulary that is tied to the age of authenticity. Yet, of course, Heidegger develops a very kind of elaborate, very complex philosophical framework with a very specific notion of Eigenlichkeit. So uh, I we use the word in a very, I use the word in a very different sense. I'm not saying my my the age of authenticity uh, is an age of Eigenlichkeit, and, and uh, Heidegger would probably agree that the age of authenticity is very much not an age of Eigenlichkeit, right? So, um, uh, uh, I think I have to say it just very briefly. Uh, so, the basic idea is, of course, that uh, there are different identity technologies and the traditional identity technologies, what we call sincerity, that means you identify by um, um, building your sense of self basically on a, on social roles, for instance, family roles. And these can also be other roles. And then you sincerely commit to these roles and thereby you develop a sense of self, for instance, by uh, through whatever motherhood or fatherhood and so forth. And these are specific, and then you sincerely commit to it. And then in modernity changes, and then we have other call it a change towards individualism, right? And these roles are increasingly dissolved for whatever, you know, historical reasons. And then the orientation switches away from the role. And in order to develop a real strong self of genuinely who you genuinely are, right? Uh, then this conf now this kind of orientation towards roles is seen as conformity, is seen as something bad. You just conform to these socially social roles. And that's not where your real self, a genuine sense of self can be found. And that's what then we call authenticity, this kind of orientation towards like, I now call it originality, right? You have to find somehow originality. Or you have an originality, again, like uh, has two different meanings. It means that which, you know, were originally, right? That which is not contingent, by the way, then, right? That is what, uh, you know, connecting whatever Christianity, your soul, and so forth, right? And then you have to find your soulmate. Or originality in the sense of creativity, right? Um, that you have to create yourself, but you do so in the same way through your own originality, right? You either define or develop your, your originality. And that's what I, what I how I define authenticity and the age of authenticity. That means shaping a sense of selfhood, shaping identity in orientation toward originality. And uh, that even works kind of uh, as uh, as Johannes said uh, with other things earlier, whatever, with Italian food, right? The idea is then, uh, or Chinese food, that it somehow originates and is or, uh, is created through the creativity of the Italian uh, uh, whatever uh, culture, right? So, so this this sense of authenticity in in this broader sense is. That's my definition. Uh, and again, I'm not claiming at all that's an Heideggerian definition, uh, but uh, through this orientation towards originality, the quest for originality, that's what defines the age of authenticity. And then also selfhood, it can only be found in and through originality. Okay. And would you and that's Johannes... new again like johannes said sorry for i also no. want to kind of the dialogue with you uh, johannes right this is the mm -hmm. who was saying like you know noid side and 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 this this uh, that's something new it's not the old stuff anymore yeah sorry i didn't completely finish that i just realized now uh that um th 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 it's really peculiar the, the ego cogito how it posits itself um and and we are 
not by any stretch of the imagination outside of that yet. I think whatever is still ongoing begins with that formula. Uh, and but interestingly, the 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 daimon here becomes external and evil, uh, and is no longer let's say internal or something that uh, could give us a certain task or so uh, of, of what we have to fulfill. Um, but instead, perhaps the fulfillment now is to become originel would be the term, right? To right originel instead of original. So not actually into the origin. But you would you would say that this is where where, where sorry where, where we are. Uh, in terms of um, capitalistic self-reproduction, so it is. No, I mean my my point is the age of authenticity is is over, is coming it's to over. an end. It's so not over, what, what but it's yeah. We're now moving on toward prophylicity, and we've we've increasingly replaced uh, or, orientation to origin originality with or with curation of profiles. Curation of profiles through social media for instance and what are they are they what are they based on what are they contingent on uh, uh profiles uh, are basically again um uh they they are tied to a second order observation so they are tied to uh, look at a brand like I, the, the core example is the brand, right? Uh, that um, uh, which precedes social media by, I don't know, a hundred years or so, right? Uh, that um, a brand, whatever, a car brand, you know, you no longer just have a car. The car has to be uh, has to be seen as something, and then uh, you you look at what the car is seen as. And that builds this kind of strong uh, sense of the identity of that car. So it's not just enough for a car to simply be a car. A car has to be a Ford or a car has to be uh, a, a car. The real identity of the car is not provided through its being a car, but through its being somehow branded. But that means being publicly observed in a specific way. And this is how you, how you uh, how you build a strong sense uh, of identity that you're building a profile. You have to create this profile, and you have to get social validation for it. So this is like these social validation feedback loops that are very important. So the brand is is really the you can say is is the model for the profile. I I would understand this as a as a form of. Uh identity simulacra like it's it's almost like the inversion of of course uh, of authenticity yes. in the sense yeah. that, that yes. it is i mean that's uh it's exactly exactly sorry for interrupting but i just want to confirm <laughs> uh that's exactly like Debord and baudrillard and derrida and um, uh the, the, you know the spectacle the simulacrum these are all notions of profilicity exactly we, because I think it ties in very well with uh, what we could talk about, maybe perhaps the, in the next conversation. Um, that, like, if you go on Twitter, for example, you have the Twitter profiles, and they have this problem now of removing bots on Twitter. And I think one of the big problems is that it, at some point uh, becomes hard to distinguish who is a real person, quote unquote, and who is a bot, because the sort of uh, profilicit, the, the sort of simulacra of these profiles. They start behaving like bots and vice versa. Right. Bots are modeled yeah, right. after bots are modeled yeah. after our profile mm. behaviors. Exactly. And so, in a sense, this sort of reduction of uh, of identities to this sort of what you say now data structures or or I'd say data structures are a sort of uh, next stage after. Uh, seeing seeing humans as a standing resource in in Gestell uh, in in Heidegger in terms again, um, that this is sort of becoming this um, grounds on which this entire next topic of artificial intelligence can flourish on, uh, as uh, as it would pre it would presuppose that there is such a thing yeah. of the big I the big self being able to be manifested in some sort of external functionality, right. And, um... Well, but that's why I would move away from the notion of identity, because what it actually what you can see is that it's uh, it's difference to stay with Derrida par excellence. 
it's uh, it's trying to you know don't follow the herd follow me um and you actually get most engagement now on twitter if you are not a bot but if you have an i uh just to you know give myself the uh to, to, to see what's going on i follow some of these big accounts um they're very often they're political in either direction or they're just sort of self-helpy uh, uh stuff and it, it's 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 utter cliches you right. know uh and and they get the most engagement you wonder right it, so but that's 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 identity and difference playing itself out i would we don't have to get into this now, but I would move away from the notion of uh, a self. Um, I would differentiate that from from identity difference. But you can see bot-like algorithmic behavior from human beings, and that's how you get how you can get most engagement. That's true. Uh, however, uh, that doesn't mean that that's all there is, um, or else. Uh, because even the so the the simulacrum still requires some remnants or memory particles, let's say, of the world. It cannot. It, it's the Matrix films, as terrible as they are. Um, Baudrillard hated them, right? As you may know, uh, for obvious reasons. So, but but even there, they, they have to create or generate manufacture a, a a simulation of the world as it was and not something utterly, and they actually there's this scene with agent smith isn't there he says we, we tried to give you paradise but it didn't work you didn't give us the energy we needed so we had to build we had to reconstruct the world as it as you were used to it or were used to it so um I was, I would just differentiate that, for that but I, we can see identity and difference uh, uh, playing out. This is in some weird way how, if you like that terminology, capital reproduces itself now. But I would still think that um, there, there is, there can be counter movements or uh, twists to that, or one can uh, um, sort of use the profile but not conflate oneself with the profile. Uh, or also not to try to subject oneself to the rule of the algorithm to get the most engagement uh, and not enslave oneself to that purely. Uh, so I think if it's unreflected, yes, that that's where we end up. But if we uh, one isn't entirely dependent upon that only, I would think. I, th I think what you what you mentioned there is probably uh, i hope georg agrees it's it's probably what what you mean by genuine pretending right it's this, exactly yes you're yeah. not you're not uh, um identifying with the profile if there's a damage to your profile you feel the damage to yourself and um interestingly Baudrillard actually he did like even though it wasn't inspired by his book he did like um the truman show as far as i know um because it had this it has this like fluid transition where you didn't know like which was what was the simulation what was reality as it was all in the same place whereas in the matrix the problem was there was this hard distinction and um and i think the the only reason for someone like truman i don't know if you've seen the truman show yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the the only way for someone like truman to even live a normal life is to develop that sort of relationship because he can't he can't start a, you know, he can't leave the the dome he grew up in and just become an entirely new person he's still truman to some extent but he needs to somehow dissociate himself from that what he was turned into or that or or this this sort of um media entity they turned truman into but still had to remain truman in a way right so so I think that's a, an interesting point where uh, what we talked about complements each other. Right. I mean, and uh, yes, uh, Sean, you're absolutely right. And uh, also like Johannes, right? Uh, that's nice how, how after a, a lot of kind of uh, twists and turns, um, we kind of managed to kind of close the circle. And uh, uh, I, th I fully agree with what Johannes said. And that was what I, I tried to say at the beginning. I just didn't say well enough about genuine pretending, right? Uh, that um, uh, 
that we understand just as as Johannes was saying that that the that the that the profile isn't really our identity and yet it's genuine right uh and uh, that we have the capacity to understand that mm -hmm. it is like um a real like you said with the Truman show right that it, that it is like um uh that it that it is a pretense that it is a play that is a game that constructs identity but again that it is contingent and that it doesn't determine us essentially right uh so uh and then that that gives us some form uh and now i'm i'm very hesitant to use a heideggerian term but some form of of releasement right and uh, heidegger, heidegger didn't use english that that reconstitutes some form of ease because whenever and this is the case with all the different identity uh technologies whenever we commit too seriously to them when we identify when we over identify with our profile when we over commit to our role we become obsessed with our originality uh, then uh then uh then we are end up with unease again both individually and collectively Right, the, all these different forms of fundamentalism, even whatever capitalism and so forth, or the stuff we see now unfolding in uh, on, on social media and the new technologies, they are all some forms of obsession, some form of of overcommitments uh, of um, uh, towards these these forms of identities. All right. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Johannes? I think um, this is actually a good place to wrap it up. Um, very briefly, there's a note by Nietzsche that I keep coming back to. And I read it again and again and again. And I gave a, I wrote a paper on it five years ago. I gave a talk in Messina a month ago, and then I read it in a different light. But he speaks of so this is from the post posthumously published uh, notebooks. He speaks of an uncanny wheelwork, an unheimliches Räderwerk, which is and the total economic the Wirtschaftsgesamtverwaltung der Erde. Ne? One word in German: total economic management <laughs> of the Earth. Um, this is Nietzsche. This is eighteen, I think, eighteen eighty-seven or so. And but of course, the wheelwork is is a metaphor. Uh, he doesn't mean a literal machine and everyone becomes a cog, a wheel within it. But it's it's interlaced into interdependency of interests so so it's some sort of the the, the global world uh, uh, uh that we inhabit to a certain degree where all is regulated by uh transaction and contract and treaties um and so this kind of insulating of interests in each is a reduction or leads to a reduction of the niveau of the the level of the human being because there cannot be anything exuberant or excessive um, because it is already pre-regulated as it were and only, it only functions too well but he sees in it uh, a or because of it a counter movement to it which he there also refers to as the Übermensch. And it seems because he says that this process is completely and entirely meaningless and it will dawn on human beings that it will be, it, it's not, at some point it, they will, they will, we will say, what was this entire machinery for? This machinery of interest, which is also related to the last man. So the, the this counter movement is one which perhaps, uh, playfully stands upon this machinery and uh, some, somewhat are aware of the, to somebody as far as, far as one can be aware of it, uh, of, of the, the machinations, but uh, still try to, um, well, I'm a, so to try to not reach individuality or so, but to become, um, not completely or not at all uh, 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 sucked into the real work uh, and be well adapted to it. Of course, that leads to the other side of the, uh, the equation also of, of the question, which is, isn't that again, just, you know, also can that not be co-opted uh, or corrupted um, by trying to be 
utterly uh, different uh, from 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 the machine and then be, become you know that becomes your brand as it were so the, the question is uh what is if any uh the way out um yeah you you uh, georg you, you quote someone in your book that says there's nothing more unoriginal than trying to be original right right yeah elena <laughs> esposito actually yes. yeah right so um yeah I, i've thought about these things as well and in, in the sense that um, there's this, a, a friend of mine refers to it as the cramp, or in German, the like Krampf of trying to, you know, dismantle the machine, trying to do something to re re revolt, you know, and somehow it just makes the machine stronger. Somehow it just, uh, mm. the, the machine will just copy you and revolt better than you can revolt. Mm. <laughs> and, right. In, in that sense. And I think right. that that is the, the, you know, it's easier said than done kind of aspect of, uh, this dissociation in in ease in die Lassenheit uh, it, it is is this attempt to actually, you know, you know, let go of the wheel <laughs> in in a good way, not in a nihilistic way, but uh, to to try and not have this this need to control to uh, um, bring under some sort of representation and control that you know th that the machine is doing that the Räderwerk is doing. Uh, and try and let whatever uh, you feel, whatever we feel, you know, at unease that has been, you know, covered and confused, uh, let disentangle itself and show itself again. Like, I, right. I feel I had that once, uh, you, you guys know I studied physics, I had that once looking at a, at a flame when we had like a bonfire at Friends, and at some point I was like, I realized I don't actually know how fire works. Like we 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 tell tell ourselves these stories with you know a chemical processes and release of energy and this and that. But you know the actual fire that's right there with its flames and its you know dancing kind of uh, light play, plays of light and stuff. That is something that just unfolds itself. You know that's something that I cannot to the last point fully control and understand and explain and simulate and model and i think this sort of understanding actually leads to a, like a deep kind of uh in a sense releasing of that cramp a relaxation in a way yes